right before we start, two small things. First of all, join my Discord server. It's fun and it's in the description. Second of all, give me video topics which you would like me to cover in the future videos. That would be helpful because I'm running out of ideas. Now let's get to the video. The real presence of our Lord Jesus Christ in the Eucharist is one of the key dogmas in the Catholic Church. And at the same time it is greatly misunderstood and hard to understand for us. Not only because it's a complex issue, but also because it's a divine reality. And so we cannot fully grasp it. And many Catholics have a hard time proving this uh, truth of faith to Protestants who accuse us of all sorts of wicked things like cannibalism and, you know, idolatry and all those bad things, which are completely untrue. And this is what I'm going to show you. This video is mainly addressed towards uh, our Protestant brothers, but also uh, if I have any Catholics here who just, you know, they understand the issue, they kind of know how to prove it and how it works, I'd also like you to stay, because maybe you'll learn something new. Uh, since the Eucharist is kind of the, the center point of our faith, what I'm going to do now is first I'm going to prove that Jesus Christ is truly present in the bread and wine which is consecrated during the Holy Mass. And then I'm gonna uh, explain to you how it works exactly, because first you have to prove something to then further explain it. So first, the Holy Scripture, because it's, uh, it's, the, it's the authority which we all accept as Christians. So, John chapter 6 verses 51 to 52. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread which, I'll shall, which I shall give for the life of the world is my flesh. So many Protestants would say he speaks symbolically here. That's actually kind of funny because how do they know he speaks symbolically? They have no central authority or even like any authority whatsoever. Every independent Baptist, Lutheran, uh, Methodist pastor interprets it in his own way. So I guess we'll never know if he's speaking um, if he's speaking literally or, or as a metaphor. And this is kind of an issue because it's it seems like it's very important here. If anyone eats of this bread he will live forever, which indicates if anyone doesn't, well we've got a problem. So I wasn't planning on making a case against Protestantism here, but this is kind of the thing I'm doing right now. And now, why is it so important to interpret this passage in a literal way? Well, first of all, it's completely logical and backed up by the scripture. See in John chapter 6 verse 60, we read that many of his disciples, when they heard it, said, this is a hard saying, who can listen to it? And then, after this, many of his disciples drew back and no longer went about him. So, he doesn't correct himself. I mean, our Lord doesn't explain it, that it's, it's to be understood, not in a literal way. Because everyone perfectly understood him, and even some of his disciples were shocked and scandalized to, the, to a degree that they left him. So we can see that if he was speaking merely... Um, metaphorically, he would have told them to come back and he would explain what he meant, because they literally left him. It's, it's a big deal. But he didn't. Why? Well, because it's true. Christ taught the truth. And it was very, very shocking for many people. But he didn't in any way explain it further. So we either believe that Christ wanted to cause doctrinal uh, confusion for some reason, which would be nonsense, or we just accept that it's to be taken literally. Now, some Protestants may quote John chapter 6, chapter 35, where he says, I am the bread of life, he who comes to me shall not hunger, and he who believes in me shall never, never thirst. 
and those uh, Protestant scholars claim that coming to him is bread in a metaphorical sense and having faith in him is drink. But there is a problem because uh, the phrase to eat the flesh and drink the blood when used figuratively among the Jews and the Arabs meant uh, to inflict upon a person some serious injury. So to interpret the phrase figuratively uh, would be to make our Lord promise life everlasting for slandering and hating him, which would be utter nonsense. And as an example of such usage is, for example, Micah chapter 3, verse 3, Who eat my people's flesh, strip of their skin and break their bones in pieces. So we can see eating somebody's flesh is, is a way in, in the Jewish culture of expressing hating somebody and, and slandering them. And Christ even makes it more explicit in John chapter 6, verse 55, uh, where he says, For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. Let's also examine John chapter 6, verse 57, where he says, As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who eats me will live because of me. And the Greek word used for eats, trogon, is very blunt, and is like chewing or gnawing. So it's not a metaphorical language, it's very physical. Let's also see what St. Paul says in his letter to Corinthians, uh, the first letter to Corinthians, chapter 10, verse 16. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? So it's, it's obvious, at this point it's very obvious. But that's not everything. Furthermore, Paul says, Therefore, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord unworthily will have to answer for the body and blood of the Lord. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 27 and 29. And to answer for the body and the blood here means to be guilty of a crime of something like homicide for death. So if this is just symbolic, then why is it so serious, such a serious guilt to receive it unworthily? Now I'd like to put aside for a second the sources such as the scripture and just talk about what Mass is. So the Council of Trent famously defined Mass as a sacrifice. It's a sacrifice in an unbloody manner and by the Eucharist we re-relive the sacrifice of Christ on the cross when he gave his life for our sins and for us to be saved. Because Protestants think that the Mass, or whatever they call it, is uh, like the Last Supper. But that's untrue because, well, the Last Supper uh, was, as we believe, an anticipation. So like a symbol, but before the actual event of the cross. So the main idea is sacrifice of the cross. And just as Christ, in a physical, in a real way, gave away his body and blood, his life, for us, in the same way we re-relive that event and we receive his body and blood in a real, not any merely symbolic way. So now we get to the fathers, the saints, the early Christians, and here I have some quotes. Well, in fact, there are many, many quotes, because it has been believed to be true since the very beginning of the church. But I will tell you some of them. Clement of Alexandria says, Eat my flesh and drink my blood. The Lord supplies us with these intimate nutrients. He delivers over his flesh and pours out his blood, and nothing is lacking for the growth of his children. Saint Hippolytus says, Body and blood, which day by day are administered and offered sacrificially at the spiritual divine table as a memorial of that first and ever memorable table of the spiritual divine supper. Oregon says, Formerly, in an obscure way, there was manna for food. Now, however, in full view, there is the true food, the flesh of the word of God, as he himself says. My flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. He also said, you are accustomed to take part in the divine mysteries, so you know how. 
When you have received the body of the Lord, you reverently exercise every care lest a particle of it fall, and lest every th anything on, of the consecrated gift perish. You account yourselves guilty, and rightly do so, you so believe, if any of it be lost through negligence. So we have to care about every single particle of that Eucharistic bread. So see how important that was for the early Christians? Saint uh, Cyprian of Carthage, uh, he said he talks about what I what I said, w what Paul uh, taught, that we should not receive the Eucharist unworthily, and he said that if we do it without confess confessing our sins, uh, it's a violence done to his body and blood. After had the Persian sage said. With his own hands the Lord presented his own body to be eaten, and before he was crucified, he gave his blood as drink. St. Cyril of Jerusalem is brilliant in his simplicity and just says, The bread and the wine of the Eucharist, before the holy invocation of the adorable Trinity, were simply bread and wine. But the invocation having been made, the bread becomes the body of Christ and the wine the blood of Christ. It's so simple. Saint Ambrose of Milan says, perhaps you may be saying, I see something else. How can you assure me that I am receiving the body of Christ? It but remains for us to prove it. And how many are the examples we might use? Christ is in that sacrament, because it is the body of Christ. So he knew some people would doubt it. Saint Augustine, whom we all love, said, that bread which you see on the altar, having been sanctified by the word of God, is the body of Christ. That chalice, or rather what is in that chalice, having been sanctified by the word of God, is the blood of Christ. Council of Ephesus says, We offer the unbloody sacrifice in the churches, and so go on to the mystical thanksgivings, and are sanctified, having received his holy flesh, and the precious blood of Christ, the Savior of us all. And the Council also says, For he is the life according to his nature, as God, and when he became united to his flesh, he made it also to be life-giving. So the flesh of Christ, which, is, which we receive uh, during the holy sacrifice of the Mass, is life-giving. And by life, they obviously mean eternal life. Well, the Protestants may say they were all wrong, but that would be peak pride. And in fact, Protestantism is peak pride because you think you're smarter than people who literally were taught by uh, the students of the apostles and so on. You know, in the early church, I think they had more understanding of what, what the apostles taught than some random weirdo who created the Reformation in the 16th century. So I guess we should follow the traditions of the fathers rather than the traditions of men made by Martin Luther and John Calvin and all those revolutionaries. And I'd like you to also uh, give me any quotes which would prove that it is symbolic. Uh, if you have any quotes from the early fathers and from the saints who said that it's merely a symbolic thing and we shouldn't even care about it that much and it's, uh, you know, anything that the, some Protestants claim, give it to me. I'm very curious. What's funny, even Luther believed in the real presence, but in some strange way, uh, but nowadays, well, <laughs> you know how it is. Protestantism just evolves into something worse day by day. And I'm sorry that I'm bashing Protestantism so much, but you have to understand one thing. I'm doing it in good faith because I want you all to convert to the truth and stop lying to yourself, stop hiding from the truth. Christ is our Lord and Savior, and he established one true church, and it is the Holy Catholic Church. And I want you all Protestant brothers to come here and come back home. This is why this video may sound aggressive or something, because I really care about your souls. We all care about your souls and your salvation, which is to be found here and not anywhere else. The last proof we have are the Eucharistic miracles. Many of them happened not so long ago and are well documented, not only by the uh, Catholic uh, researchers, but also by the uh, secular uh, scholars. Uh, 
And a, a Eucharistic miracle is when uh, the host, so the bread, changes into a, a living tissue, and all, all those sorts of miracles uh, where the Eucharist is involved. Uh, and this you can check online. The church um, recognizes around uh, a thousand of them. So yeah, uh, you can you can search that up yourself because. I don't want this video to be too long. Wait a second, until we get to how it works exactly, how how does the the bread become the flesh and how does wine become the blood? Uh, let me quote, let me paraphrase Saint Thomas Aquinas. He says not only the Church always believed this uh, truth, but also it's the most fitting because it it allows the church to enjoy a perpetual presence of Christ down the down through the history always in every catholic church we have Christ in the tabernacle we have him always in a real profound true way basically everywhere around the world except some places where there are no catholic churches but it just makes the most sense and as we all know God likes when things make sense. Now, how does the Eucharist exactly work? Well, as I said, first of all, it's a mystery of faith, and it's hard to understand everything about it, because it's, it's supernatural, it's divine, and it transcends our ability to reason, but we can know some things about it. First of all, what does it mean that something is present somewhere? Well, there is two ways how one can become present somewhere. First is by the change of place. For example, if I'm going from London to uh, Warsaw, I'm changing place and I appear in Warsaw. So I'm beginning to be present there. Another way is a change of substance. So for example, uh, when you build a, a, a house which was not previously there, uh, then the house becomes present in that place. So we're obviously not talking about a change of place here. Christ doesn't leave heaven to be in the tabernacle and then come back to heaven. That would be, well, weird. So we are obviously considering the change of substance here, as Christ is not altered. He is still in glory, sitting on a throne in heaven, obviously. So it's a change of substance. Okay, I know what you're thinking right now. Because if you've ever been to the Catholic Mass, you know, magic doesn't happen there. It's still, it still looks like bread, it smells like bread, it's basically, materially, it's, it's the same thing. So what does it really mean? What has changed because of the consecration? And the answer to that is transubstantiation. And I know it's a hard and long word, but what it means is that God leaves the accidental properties of a being uh, and only change the substance, which is um, like a, a metaphysical category. And I, I should explain probably what it means right now. So let's use the ship of Theseus. Uh, it's a thought experiment of, of the ancient Greek philosophy. So if you have a ship and during the, the cruise, all the elements like the planks and everything are replaced. So the old ones are thrown away and the new ones are installed in their place. And every single element is changed. In the substance, it's basically the same ship, right? It's the same being. Its accidental properties changed, uh, but it's the same ship, it's the same being. So this kind of deep uh, fundamental property uh, of substance is changed here, even though it still looks like bread and feels like bread and tastes like bread and has chemical uh, properties of a bread, it's not bread. Uh, and yeah, and you could you could I think use the example of a human body. All cells, each I don't I don't remember seven years or so are replaced. Every single cell in your body is replaced, and yet you're still the same person. So I think those are the two key examples to understand what is happening here. Uh, and so does such thing as the transubstantiation uh, appear anywhere in nature? No. But that doesn't mean that God can't do it. And I think it's part of the part of the issue here. It's something unique. 
is a sacrament. Nothing like this ever ever occurs in nature, because it 